In World War I, Germany adopted the policy of sinking at sight without warning in an effort to force the Allies, and particularly England, into submission. This was unrestricted submarine warfare, and in World War II, Germany, after much research into the matter, adopted the same line, but this too ended in failure. The United States adopted these tactics against Japan and achieved great success by concentrating her main effort with submarines on severing lines of communication. The Japanese policy was to use submarines primarily for attacking enemy naval forces. Attacks on merchant shipping had only second priority. Thus, enemy aircraft carriers were the chief target, then battleships and other naval craft. Merchant ships were legitimate targets only when there were no warships to be considered. Throughout the war, destruction of commerce was undertaken only when the fighting strength of the fleet was allowed. Submarine 16 was in the Kauai Channel to the southeast of Pearl Harbor on December 10, 1941, and received a report. Two cruisers and Lexington-class aircraft carrier on the northeasterly course. The Admiral, commanding the 6th Fleet in his flagship Katori at Kwajalein Base in the Marshall Islands, immediately ordered pursuit by submarines of the 1st Submarine Squadron, comprising I-9, 15, 17, 19, 21, 23 and 25, which was stationed to the north of Oahu Island. Orders were also given to submarines I-10 and 26 to stand by. These were stationed on the route between Hawaii and the American mainland, where they patrolled, alert, awaiting the appearance of the aircraft carrier. But nothing was sighted. The hunt was continued to a point near the American coast, when it became clear that the quarry had escaped. This unit was instructed to attack merchant shipping in this area. By then, the force included submarines I-26, 25, 9, 17, 15, 23, 21, 19 and 10, and among them they ranged from off Seattle in the north to Los Angeles in the south. These were the latest submarines then available, with a displacement of 2,000 tonnes carrying an aircraft and having a surface speed of 24 knots. I-9 and 10 were special larger types. They continued to operate against merchant ships during the latter half of December, but at about this time there was a great increase in the efficiency of American patrols. During this period about 10 tankers and cargo ships were sunk. Submarine I-26 on the northern end of the patrol had left on operations immediately after her reconstruction, and like I-24, in which I was serving prior to the outbreak of war, had carried out practically no working up programme, and in consequence suffered a series of defects. After carrying out a patrol in the Aleutians just prior to the war, she was stationed between Hawaii and San Francisco at the outbreak of hostilities. On the morning of December 8, I-26 sank a 3,000-ton class military transport by gunfire, scoring the first kill by a Japanese submarine in the war. She then proceeded to the vicinity of Vancouver, where she fired a torpedo at a merchant ship, but missed. According to the pre-war battle instructions, the numbers of torpedoes to be fired at various targets were rigidly fixed, that is, merchant ships and destroyers one torpedo, cruisers three, battleships and aircraft carriers all available tubes. This limited the chances of hitting a merchant ship rather severely, for it must be remembered that a torpedo does not run as accurately as a shell fired from a gun. Various trials had shown that a hit could be expected at the short range of about 800 yards, but outside this, a hit with one torpedo would be very doubtful. On about December 27, submarine I-25, commanded by Commander Tagami, approached to within 10 miles of the Columbia River entrance, and, surfacing in dark and rainy conditions, torpedoed the 20,000-ton ship Connecticut and brought her to a stop. She didn't seem to be sinking, and the captain was about to fire a second torpedo when she started to go down. The crew got away in boats and, according to the American radio, landed safely on shore. Submarine 123, under Commander Nishida, opened fire with her gun at an old gunboat on the surface in daylight, but failed to obtain many hits. On pursuit, the gunboat made for Monterey Bay, and her rudder was hit, causing her to go round in circles, much to the consternation of those watching on shore. Eventually, the gunboat ran aground, and having given her a few more rounds, the submarine put her to sea. At the end of December, the submarines left the American coast, 
and by mid-January had arrived at the base at Quasar Lane in the Marshalls, while submarine Wine 25 was on passage between Johnston Island and the Marshalls, she picked up some enemy signals on her direction-finding set and proceeded along the requisite bearing. Just before sunset on January 8, the gunnery officer, Sub-Lieutenant Takahashi, who was on watch, reported, Island in sight, further inspection suggested that it was not an island but a warship. The captain immediately dived the boat and made the approach with all tubes ready. Periscope inspection revealed what now seemed to be a seaplane carrier. The flight deck and derricks could be seen, with five aircraft ranging on deck. She had stopped when the submarine got sufficiently close to have a good look. With a smile on his face, the captain fired four torpedoes, all of which were hit. After these operations against merchant shipping, I-8 left Kwajalein on a similar patrol at the end of January and arrived west of San Francisco in early February. She cruised as far north as Seattle, but had no opportunities for attack and returned to Japan at the beginning of March. Submarine 117, with a companion vessel, set out in search of an enemy task force which attacked Kwajalein Anchorage on February 2, but failed to make any contact and carried on to the west coast of North America, arriving off San Diego on February 20. After the bombardment of Santa Barbara, already described, I-17 sank a merchant ship by torpedo off San Francisco, but was fired on when surfacing after the attack. It seemed that the enemy had already armed its merchantmen. Subsequently, I-6 sank another merchant ship before returning to home waters at the end of March. After this, the attack on shipping off the American coast was temporarily abandoned, but on her return passage from attacking the Oregon coast with incendiaries, I-25 carried out some attacks at the northern sector of the American coastline in early October when she sank two tankers. Continuing to search for targets, she was herself attacked by American bombers at a most inopportune moment, for everyone, including the engine room staff, was out on deck smoking. The bombs fell when she had submerged to a depth of only 20 feet. Luckily, damage was confined to the aerial, which was destroyed, causing a leak. It became impossible to transmit messages, but nevertheless she continued on patrol. Next, while cruising to the north of Seattle, she sighted what looked like a warship's mast. This proved to be two United States submarines on a southeasterly course. There was only one torpedo left. This was fired after closing in to 500 yards. The torpedo scored a hit, and one American submarine sank after a loud explosion. But owing to the nearness of the vessel, the violent concussion sprang all I-25's rivets. At the end of May 1942, in anticipation of the Aleutian and Midway operations, submarines I-25 and 26 proceeded to the vicinity of Seattle via the Aleutians, and while on patrol at the entrance to Straits of Vancouver, sank one merchant ship. In 1943, all units were fighting in the Solomons, and there is nothing to record from the American area. Some results were achieved in this area in 1944, and I-12 sank two ships toward the end of that year. But all news of this submarine ceased after January 1945. These operations off the American coast, though only on a restricted scale, were thus not unsuccessful. The Indian Ocean provided another operational area. After the fall of Penang in the Malay Peninsula into Japanese hands, our submarines proceeded, in January 1942, into the Indian Ocean, without waiting for the fall of Singapore, and began their attacks on merchant ships. Up until 1944, the scale of enemy convoys in that area was light, and while the number of our submarines so employed varied according to circumstances, attacks on merchant shipping were maintained throughout the period. Although under the terms of our agreement with Germany, some changes in the situation occurred from time to time. Generally, the area of operations assigned to Japanese submarines extended from the Arabian Sea to South Africa and covered the whole of the Indian Ocean. Our losses were small and the harvest large, while in the Pacific it was just the other way round. As a result, all submarine captains preferred operating in the Indian Ocean. I must confess that I myself hoped to be sent to this area, but unfortunately the chance did not materialise. Compared with the bases in the southern seas, Penang was better equipped in every way and was very popular with submarine crews, 
and the Indian Ocean campaign was regarded almost as a paradise compared with the Hell War in the Pacific. The sinking of unescorted merchant ships presented no difficulty. The more venturesome submarine captains would go alongside the enemy vessels and set fire to them with petrol, thus economising in shells and torpedoes. The majority of these captains later met their end in the Pacific. Appendix B gives a list of the 80 vessels sunk in the Indian Ocean for the loss of only two Japanese submarines, I-160 and 34. I-160 was sunk by a British destroyer in the Sunda Straits and the other by a British submarine at the entrance to Penang when en route to Japan in November 1943. One of the most notable operations was that carried out by units of the 8th Submarine Squadron in the Mozambique Channel during two separate periods, extending over three months. All units returned safely to Penang at the beginning of August. Two raiding vessels, Hokokumaru and Aikokumaru, equipped with torpedo tubes, operated with the submarines. As well as acting as fuel tankers for the submarines, they captured one vessel and sank another. In 1944 too, although the situation in the Pacific was deteriorating, destruction of merchant shipping in the Indian Ocean continued, but the scale of enemy convoys increased, the numbers of available submarines gradually fell, and our losses began to mount. On February 11, 1944, RO-110 was sunk in action with an Allied gunboat off Visagapatam, Bay of Bengal, and all news of I-27 ceased in February of the same year. In September 1944, I-8, 37, 165, RO-113 and 115 were stationed in the Indian Ocean, but toward the end of the year these vessels were gradually withdrawn to take part in the Pacific War, and within six months all were lost in that area. Submarine 16 successfully laid magnetic mines from her torpedo tubes in the vicinity of Brisbane. We learned about these mines from the Germans. Two or three were carried in each tube, and when dropped at suitable intervals they sank to the bottom. Submarines I-121, 122, 123 and 124 were specially equipped for mine-laying duties. In addition to the bow tubes, the stern of the boat was specially adapted for laying mines. They were normally styled mine-laying submarines, with a displacement of over 1,000 tonnes and a surface speed of 14 knots, and were an obsolete type of vessel completed about 1925 to 1927. In 1940, they were equipped with petrol tanks on the upper deck for refuelling aircraft, and were thus able to carry out an additional role. Their peculiar construction made them very difficult boats to handle. Their surface speed was slow, and they were difficult to manoeuvre submerged, owing to their small hydroplanes and rudders. The slightest difference in weight forward or aft gave them a list, if the least bit lightened, they tended to surface, and if made over heavy, they tended to sink. They were known throughout the service as the dreaded submarines. I served as torpedo officer of one of these craft in 1940. When a mine was dropped, a compensatory weight of water had to be let in, otherwise the stern would break surface. If too much water were let in, the boat would sink. The 48 mines had to be moved one by one to the tail of the boat, while water was pumped to the fore-end to prevent the boat from becoming tail-heavy, a really dangerous task. Some accidents due to faulty procedure were reported, including casualties caused by the sudden movement of mines due to bad trimming. Personally, I was fortunate enough to avoid being responsible for any mishaps, thanks to the skill of our coxswain, who had had six years' service in submarines. It was extremely difficult to keep the boat level, and at the prescribed depth, and at the same time lay the mines in the correct positions. Usually the mines had to be laid with a two-knot tide running at the entrance to bays, and very careful cooperation between captain and navigator was necessary to avoid any dangerous error. On December 1, just before the outbreak of war, the mine-laying unit assembled at Hainan Island left harbour. Forty mines were laid secretly on December 8 by I-123 in the western entrance to the Balabac Strait, and by I-124 off Manila. After completing this task, I-124 rescued aircraft crews, who had crashed in the air attack on Manila, and was also engaged in sending out weather reports. Submarines I-121 and 122 laid mines in the Singapore Channel, 
and sank a merchant ship escaping from this area on December 10. I-123 subsequently laid mines at the northern entrance to the Surabaya Strait, and I-121 made another visit to Manila Bay, but was unable to lay mines because of the vigilance of enemy patrols. In addition, submarine I-6 laid mines from her torpedo tubes as previously related. In June 1942, it was planned to try to weaken the resolve of the enemy to fight by carrying out large-scale commerce destruction in the Indian Ocean and Australian areas, and also with the idea of wiping out the effect of defeat of Midway. However, the enemy chose this moment for his counter-attack in the Solomons, and most of our submarines had to concentrate in this area to counteract this. Nevertheless, small forces continued to operate in the Indian Ocean and Australian areas, and the 8th Submarine Squadron proceeded with these operations on completion of the midget attacks at Sydney and Diego Suarez. In mid-June, after the Battle of Midway, the 3rd Submarine Squadron too had commenced commerce destruction in the Australian area. I-24 attacked a merchant ship at night while off Sydney, but owing to a premature torpedo detonation, the merchant ship was able to make off at full speed. The captain of I-24 immediately gave the order to surface and engage by gunfire, but with no searchlight it was difficult to score a hit in the pitch dark. Eventually one round did hit, which stopped the ship, and the crew took to the boats. I-24 was then able to sink the vessel by torpedo, but intercepted an SOS from the doomed ship saying she was being attacked by a submarine and asking for assistance. There were other instances of premature detonations, and these were due to oversensitive fuses, which were afterward remedied. In this particular instance, the captain hesitated before using any further torpedoes, but is said to have sunk two more ships. After our withdrawal from Guadalcanal, enemy patrols became more vigilant and our losses increased. This was due in part to the development by the enemy of warning devices, and also to the enemy's control in the air as our own carrier aircraft strength declined. Furthermore, enemy transports were using the inside of the Great Barrier Reef off the northeast coast of Australia, where anti-submarine precautions were very strict. So that little success was achieved in cutting off the enemy's supply routes to the rear in the Guadalcanal and New Guinea areas, although it was reputed for a time that aircraft in Australia were without petrol. Generally, the situation seemed to be turning against us, the 6th Fleet Headquarters at the submarine base on Truk Island viewed matters with increasing concern. Since the vast territories between Japan and Germany were all hostile, the only means of communication was by the long sea route across the Indian Ocean, round the Cape of Good Hope to the Atlantic, and so to occupied France. This was the route followed by the Russian Baltic Fleet during the Russo-Japanese War, a distance of over 15,000 miles. The difficulties en route were very great and a constant source of worry in addition to enemy submarines, aircraft and patrol craft. The track passed through the Roaring Forties and there were many changes in climate. The hardships in the cold weather were almost unbearable. It is not surprising, therefore, that out of five boats, only one made the return voyage without mishap. Several German submarines came to Singapore and also to Japan itself, Indeed, Admiral Nomura returned to the home country in a German submarine. A number of Japanese army officers planned their liaison trips by German submarine, but few returned safely to Japan, and all made their wills before leaving Berlin for the return journey. Submarine 130, Commander S. Endo, was the first to be selected for the voyage to Germany. After taking part in the midget submarine operation at Diego Suarez, this submarine having fueled and taken in supplies from the raiders Hokoku Maru and Aikoku Maru, left her consorts and proceeded independently via the Cape of Good Hope. Being the beginning of July, it was exceedingly rough in the Roaring Forties, but she got through and entered the Bay of Biscay on August 2. Three days later, she was met by German minesweepers and arrived at Lorient the same day. Having exchanged equipment and other commodities, the captain was decorated with a German medal, and the boat set out on her return journey, arriving back at Singapore in October 1942. But on her departure from that port, she struck a British mine and sank, and much valuable material was lost, though most of her crew were saved. At the end of June 1943, Submarine 18 completed preparations for a long trip.
She was to take to Brest a crew whose job it would be to bring back to Japan the submarine RO501, built in Germany for the Japanese submarine fleet. As a present for the Germans, I-8 took a cargo of quinine. In company with I-10, she sailed from Penang on July 6, under the command of Captain Shinji Uchino. The first part of the journey across the Indian Ocean was uneventful and was accomplished in reasonable comfort, for the swell usually affecting these waters was absent. Refueling from I-10 was carried out according to plan, and I-8 proceeded on her way round the Cape of Good Hope. To avoid enemy patrols expected in the vicinity, I-8's course lay some 300 miles off the Cape, through an area where the Roaring Forties are said to extend over a thousand-mile belt. For ten days she battled with tremendous seas, unable to do more than five knots. The upper deck and bridge were damaged, and the aircraft hangar swayed so much as the water swept over that eventually it shifted bodily. Twice members of the crew, secured by lifelines, effected repairs in the teeth of the gale, eventually calmer waters were reached, and I-8 was able to continue on her way, making for the Bay of Biscay. As she headed north of the West African coast, she had to keep well clear of the United States air base in the Azores. At an appointed rendezvous just south of the Azores, she made contact with a German U-boat and in the space of four hours the Germans had equipped I-8 with radar search gear, without which the dangers of sudden air attack would have been very great. The Japanese radar equipment originally fitted had proved useless. Personnel from the U-boat rowed over to I-8 in a rubber dinghy, a somewhat old-fashioned method of communication, but the operation was carried out safely and I-8 went on her way again, setting course for Brest. In the Bay of Biscay, passing five miles off the Spanish coast, it was necessary to remain submerged to avoid merchant ships and the undesired attention of enemy aircraft. Enemy patrols were very alert at the entrance to the bay, but German aircraft came out in support. Nearer Brest, this escort was augmented by more aircraft and ten German destroyers, while torpedo boats swept a passage through the magnetic mines into harbour. On September 5, I-8 slipped through the last protected entrance and into the U-boat bunker. There she lay, roofed over with some twenty feet of reinforced concrete, immune from air attack at last, after her sixty-one days' voyage from Penang. In the German submarine bases, the repair shops and the accommodation were all protected in this way, so that whatever the scale of air attack, boats could be repaired and crews rested in complete safety. By contrast, conditions in the major naval ports in Japan were lamentable. Every air attack was the occasion of much confusion. By mid-September, I-8 prepared to sail on her return voyage. Several hundred tons of material needed in Japan were taken on board. Even the torpedo tubes were filled. The cargo included machinery for torpedoes, four-barrel machine guns, machine guns for aircraft and deck watches. Those made in Japan were inaccurate and unsuitable for astronomical observations. I-8 sailed under strong escort. As a safety measure, it was decided that after the escort had bidden farewell and left I-8 to proceed alone, communication between the submarine and the German Navy would be restricted to three signals sent by wireless telegraphy. Past position A, indicating left greatest danger area, past position B, indicating crossed the equator, and past position C, meaning left Atlantic. Position A was passed and reported as I-8 crossed the equator heading south, thinking all was safe. She duly signalled past position B. The next day an enemy aircraft appeared. It seemed that the message had given the enemy a direction-finding bearing. I-8 dived quickly and escaped, but the following morning, when she was on the surface, she was attacked by an enemy plane. As she was diving deep to the 180-foot mark, the plane dropped its bombs. The lights in the submarine grew dim. Water was reported to be entering the crew's quarters. For a moment it seemed that the end had come, but soon the inrush of water was traced to a leaky valve. The defect was rectified speedily, and further inspection proved that, after all, little damage had been sustained. Everyone relaxed. But she remained submerged for the rest of the day, in the roaring forties rough weather smashed the glass on the bridge, but otherwise on the return voyage there was no damage to the upper deck. In this area, Y-8 remained submerged during daylight for two successive days, 
to avoid being spotted in the vicinity of enemy bases. Afterward, she was able to proceed on the surface, and though she was buffeted by gales as on the outward journey, the wind was somewhat less severe. In the Indian Ocean, it was deemed safe to affix identity marks. In the midst of this operation, an aircraft appeared and swooped down on the submarine as it lay on the surface. Fortunately, it was a friendly plane. By the time she entered the Indian Ocean, fuel was running low, signals were sent off to Penang Base and to Japanese units in the Indian Ocean. There was no reply, so I-8 continued on her journey, passing through the Sunda Strait and reaching Singapore early in December. The return passage thus took 64 days. Later, I-8 reached Japan safely. She was the only Japanese submarine to accomplish the round trip of 30,000 miles. The German passengers carried on the return voyage were three naval officers, four radar and hydrophone technicians, a German army major and four civilians. Thanks to German foresight, the food was mostly rice, probably grown in Italy and southern France. At first, the Germans ate one Japanese meal every day, but after about ten days, they all asked for bread instead. Submarine 129, Commander T. Kinashi, having received orders to contact a German submarine in the Indian Ocean, left Penang in early April 1943. Proceeding through the Mozambique Channel, she met the German submarine 400 miles south-southwest of Madagascar on April 28. Here she embarked Chandra Bose, the leader of the Indian independence movement, and one of his companions, and, after transferring an officer destined for Germany, she proceeded on the return voyage, reaching Penang early in May. The successful accomplishment of this voyage gave an impetus to the Indian independence movement and damped down the idea of an Allied offensive in the Indian area. I-29 was later employed in attacking shipping in the Indian Ocean. Early in November 1943, she sailed again from Penang, this time bound for Germany. Following the same route as I-30 and 8, she arrived safely on the west coast of France. On the return journey between Singapore and Japan, she was torpedoed by a United States submarine in the Bashi Channel off southern Formosa. The captain and most of the crew perished in 1943. I-104 completed preparations in Japan for a voyage to Germany, and then spent a week in Singapore, loading rubber, tin, tungsten and quinine. On November 11, she sailed from Singapore and proceeded through the Strait of Malacca. However, when almost in sight of Penang Island, and despite the strict lookout that was being kept, she was torpedoed and sunk by a British submarine. Submarine RO501, which had been built in Germany and was operated by a Japanese crew under the command of Commander Norida, started her voyage to Japan. But no news was received from her after she entered the Atlantic, and she was in fact sunk after being in action with a United States destroyer on May 13, 1944. The last submarine to essay the trip, I-52, Commander K. Uno, was a victim of the Normandy landings. Constructor commanders Hideo Tomonaga and M. Shoji, who had been working in Germany, received instructions to return to Tokyo in early 1945. It was arranged for them to take passage in a German submarine, Commander Tomonaga was a leading ship constructor, and Commander Shoji a first-rate technician in aircraft design. Their services were urgently required by the Japanese Navy. Details were arranged with the German naval authorities, and passengers and cargo were to be transferred to a Japanese submarine in the Indian Ocean. It was the end of January 1945. Berlin, in a temperature of four or five degrees above zero, was nightly undergoing very heavy bombing raids, there were no electric light, no fuel, most of the windows were broken, and there were bitterly cold winds. The Allied anti-submarine measures had recently increased in intensity, and the Atlantic had become almost a graveyard for German submarines. Thus, the passage of these officers in a German submarine was fraught with great danger. The German U-boat failed to rendezvous with the Japanese submarine. Some weeks later, news of their fate was broadcast by a United States shortwave transmitter. While on patrol in the Gulf of Mexico, a United States patrol craft captured a German submarine flying the white flag. The German captain and the crew were made prisoners and taken into custody ashore. The United States authorities who searched the interior of the boat discovered the bodies of two Japanese naval officers in uniform, 
who had committed suicide by taking poison. The Battle of Midway took place on June 4, 1942. The Japanese Navy, excelling in carrier strength and flushed with victory after the Hawaiian attack, was unaware that operational secrets had leaked out. And so, we fell into the trap laid by the enemy, who was forewarned of our movements. A severe defeat ensued for the Japanese. Midway was a crucial battle which reversed the whole position in the Pacific War. On June 6, a flying boat observed that the American carrier Yorktown had been abandoned. The eventual destruction of this ship was the only success we achieved in the Battle of Midway. Submarine 1168, Commander Tanabe, which was in the vicinity, received an urgent signal to sink the carrier Yorktown in position 150 miles to the northeast of Midway. All preparations for attack were made, and I-168 proceeded at 21 knots to the position indicated. At about one o'clock on the morning of June 6, a black mass resembling a warship was sighted to the east. Daylight came. It was without doubt an aircraft carrier with five or six destroyers circling round on guard. I-168 approached, seeking a favourable position for breaking through the destroyer screen. She passed beneath the first line of destroyers undetected and came up to periscope depth. Inspection revealed the carrier was a little down by the stern, and this was confirmed on inspection from the opposite side. This was so remarkable that the captain made a closer inspection and found that the ship was in tow. Finally, I-168 was able to get into position for attack. Four torpedoes were fired at 10am nine hours after the ship was first sighted. The rumbling sound of the explosion followed, and a cry of exultation went up from those inside the submarine. According to American sources made available after the war, two torpedoes hit the carrier, and another hit the destroyer alongside, cutting it in two. The Yorktown turned over and sank the following day. There was considerable reaction on the part of the destroyers guarding the Yorktown. In less than 15 minutes after the incident, three destroyers began a depth charge attack. I-168 suffered 60 near misses, the worst of which lifted the boat almost a foot. The paint from the deck above came flaking down and the lights went out, leaving the boat in pitch darkness. The batteries were damaged and poisonous chlorine gas began to escape. Just when everyone thought the attack was over, another three depth charges exploded so close that they shook the boat, she lay crippled, unable to move, and with no pumps working. In order to remain submerged, water had to be taken in or expelled by air pressure. Work began at once to repair the lighting and isolate the damaged batteries. As it was impossible to use the trimming pumps, the boat was slanting upward at an angle of 20 degrees. It was just like being stranded halfway up a steep hill. But still there was hope. Working at this acute slope, the electricians had to be held in position by their mates so that they did not slip. Efforts to bring the boat out on an even keel by moving men and foodstuffs forward were of no avail. Though there had been no fatal break nor inrush of water, the damage to the batteries was critical, for the main electrical supply was cut, leaving the boat without means of turning the propeller. The most vital task was to isolate the unusable battery and connect up the good ones. Although the crew had had much training in the operation of isolating a battery, the drill had not envisaged so large a break. In the dim light and with chlorine gas escaping steadily, it seemed the job would be impossible to finish. But at last the damaged battery was isolated and the stage was reached when the current was available again. Having inspected the connections to the motors, the chief electrician reported that he was satisfied, the switch was closed and the propeller started to move, the lights came on and the hopes of all were realised. The destroyers were still about overhead, so it was impossible to use the air pumps because of the noise they made. There was no compressed air for discharging the water, which was still coming in through the rear tubes, and it was therefore no longer possible to proceed submerged, so there was nothing else to do but to surface and fight it out with the enemy. There were three destroyers in sight at 10,000 yards. To add to the difficulties, Acid was found leaking from the damaged batteries, which once more suddenly ceased to function. On investigation, it was found necessary to cut out more cells. Meanwhile, the three destroyers had turned about, spotted the submarine, and were coming in to the attack. The range fell to 5,000 yards. They came closer, firing their guns. 
It was essential to get even a little compressed air, but enemy shells had begun to straddle the submarine, and the captain decided to submerge once more and lie still, for it would be dark in half an hour, and in the darkness escape might still be possible. Hunting their quarry, the destroyers passed directly overhead, but after firing only a few depth charges they withdrew. Perhaps they had no more left. The sound of their propellers grew less and finally ceased. At last repairs were completed and the lights came on again. It was 8 p.m., the sun had set and the sound of the enemy ship's propellers had entirely disappeared. I-168 surfaced thankfully and made off to the west and her home country at a speed of 16 knots, making a detour to avoid an area ahead where star shells were being fired. What were the other submarines doing during the important period of the Midway battle? One of them was to use French frigate Shoal Anchorage for the second Pearl Harbor reconnaissance operation. This was planned as before, the submarine to refuel the flying boat, which would then attempt to observe the ships at anchor in Pearl Harbor. During the latter part of May, when the supply submarines I-21 and 23 came to reconnoitre French frigate Shoal Anchorage, they found that a United States seaplane carrier and other patrol craft were already there. We also had I-171, 174 and 175 acting as wireless link ships and patrolling the area, but they had little opportunity to achieve anything. On May 25 they reported, patrols too alert, no prospects, they waited until May 31, but conditions were unchanged, so the operation was cancelled, and no knowledge was gained of the situation in Pearl Harbor. On this occasion, the Americans had forestalled us by sending patrol craft to the spot. Other plans, too, failed. Twelve vessels of the 3rd and 5th submarine squadrons comprising submarines I-168, 169, 171, 174, 175, and 156, 157, 158, 159, 162, 165, and 166, I-164, was sunk off Kyushu on May 17 and did not participate, left Kwajalein on May 25, and reached positions along the route between Pearl Harbor and Midway by June 6, in an attempt to catch the American reinforcements. The enemy, however, was forewarned of this plan, and so arranged that the task force passed the approaches to Midway earlier than originally scheduled. Thus, we were left carrying on the pursuit from too far astern, and not a single ship was sighted. We had no clear idea of the position of the task force, and in consequence, with the exception of I-168, we were unable to use our submarine strength in the Midway operations. In 1942, the Japanese 4th Fleet, commanded by Vice Admiral Inoue, carried out an attack on Port Moresby in an effort to gain complete control of New Guinea. The fleet comprised the large aircraft carriers Shokaku and Zuikaku, the light carrier Shoho, cruisers, destroyers and transports. The following submarine units were also included in the command. 21st Submarine Flotilla Submarines, Row 33 and 104, 8th Submarine Squadron, 11th Submarine Flotilla Submarines, I-29 and 28, 3rd Submarine Flotilla Submarines, I-22 and 24. By the end of April, Submarines Row 33 and 104 had reconnoitred Russell Island and Des Boyne Anchorages, Joma Channel, and the route to the east of Port Moresby, and investigated the presence or otherwise of the enemy in transport anchorages and shipping routes. Submarines I-22, 24, 28 and 29 reached their stations on May 5, but had no opportunities for attacking the enemy. Submarines RO-33 and 104 also failed to sight the enemy. Thus, at the Battle of the Coral Sea, no positive results were obtained from submarines, and there were also no losses. On August 7, 1942, the United States forces launched the first phase of their large-scale counterattack on Guadalcanal. The Commander-in-Chief 8th Fleet, Admiral Mikawa, himself led his cruiser force into action in the first naval battle of the Solomon Islands and achieved great success. But when he attacked a second time, he was unable to cause any damage to the enemy landing operations or to his transports. The enemy not only held on to the airfield, but gradually consolidated the defences, 
and in the period between August 1942 and February 1943, when the Japanese forces withdrew from the island, there was much desperate fighting by land, sea and air. In the meantime, our submarines were engaged in transporting supplies, attacking enemy transports, cutting off enemy reinforcements, refuelling aircraft, or else watching for chances to attack enemy naval forces. Thus, they all made a contribution to the heavy demands placed upon them, unfortunately. This area was badly charted for friend and foe alike. There were cases of grounding on uncharted shoals, and operations were carried out under difficult conditions. Furthermore, the unceasing counterattacks by enemy aircraft and surface vessels doubled our losses. From about September 1942, the efficiency of enemy radar equipment increased and our former supremacy, which had depended on the excellence of our binoculars, soon disappeared when it came to facing enemy aircraft on a dark night or in poor visibility. Night actions, operations where formerly we had excelled, now became difficult, and this also was a contributory cause to our mounting losses. On August 7, on receipt of the report of the enemy landing on Guadalcanal Island, Admiral Mikawa immediately ordered all the submarines under his command to concentrate in indispensable strait. Submarines, row 104 and 33, I-121, 122 and 123 of the 7th Submarine Squadron, proceeded to hunt for the enemy in Lunga and Tulagi anchorages. Submarine Row 33, after contacting the survivors on Guadalcanal Island and handing over medical supplies, sank an enemy transport in Lunga anchorage. This submarine was then continuously depth-charged over a distance of 18 miles, but only its periscope was damaged. I-121 and 123 were ordered to bombard the enemy landing operations, and I-122 to search for the enemy in the Santa Cruz Islands area. All surface vessels and all air units joined in the attack, and the submarines were redeployed off Guadalcanal Island and the area to the southeast of the Solomon Islands. On August 24, submarines I-9, 15, 17, 19, 26, 31 and 33 which had hurried from Truk, arrived at the enemy dispersal lines between San Cristobal and Undeni Islands, and sighted an enemy task force had left Yokosuka on August 15, and arrived at the scene of action off the Solomons from Truk. To the northeast of the Solomons, she sighted an enemy task force of an aircraft carrier, one battleship, a cruiser, and about ten destroyers. Attack was difficult, but she scored a hit on a Lexington-class carrier with one of her torpedoes, after firing her torpedoes, I-26 was very close to the destroyers and therefore dived to 300 feet. Four depth charges were dropped, but I-26 escaped damage. From the end of December 1942, submarines RO-100, 101, 102 and 103 were gradually organised into the 7th Submarine Squadron and were active in the vicinity of Rabul. This class of submarine was the smallest in existence in Japan at the time and was intended for coastal defence. They were stationed mainly off Port Moresby, the area to the southeast of Milne Bay, the eastern portion of the Central Solomons and the Jomard Channel, and at times carried out transport duties. By mid-August 1943, the 7th Submarine Squadron had comprised submarines Row 104, 100, 101, 102, 103, 106 and 107, but had lost row 104, 102, 103 and 107, and had only the sinking of a transport by RO 106 in July to offset its own losses. On April 1, 1943, a big counter-attack, known as Operation One, was begun with combined naval and air forces under the personal command of Admiral Yamamoto, the Commander-in-Chief Combined Fleet, and attacks delivered in quick succession on April 7 achieved some success, but in face of the overwhelming air strength of the enemy, it was just like throwing water on thirsty soil. At the beginning of May, the Allied armies landed on Rendover in the New Guinea archipelago and began the westward advances in New Guinea. Against the landing operations at Rendover, the Japanese army put up stiff resistance with their forces on the spot, and with reinforcements hurried from Rabul, while a destroyer squadron and its flagship, a cruiser, 
carried out repeated counterattacks, but their objectives were unobtainable in face of the pressure of enemy naval and air strength. In fact, our forces were routed and suffered heavy losses. The RO-100 class submarines hurried to the scene of action. The RO-101, proceeding in advance, had been detailed to carry out her fourth trip to the western area of Guadalcanal and instructed to contain the landing and attack. During September, submarines Row 101, 105, 106 and 109 concentrated their efforts on the area to the south and southeast of the Solomon Group. Submarines Row 100, 104 and 108 were to attack the enemy in the Huon Bay area of eastern New Guinea. The direct results of these operations were nil, although submarine Row 105 succeeded in rescuing an aircrew who had made a forced landing, but nothing further was heard of RO-101. From mid-August 1943, submarines Row 104, 105, 108 and 109 were reinforced and continued with the same assignments, but the task of counter-attacking the enemy who was landing anywhere at will was completely hopeless. Thus, the RO-100 class submarines performed all manner of tasks over a wide area and had no opportunities for rest or refit. Row 108, operating in the Huon Bay area from the end of September, sighted and attacked three enemy destroyers 50 miles to the north of Cape Wardhunt on October 3. She was heavily depth-charged, but two of the destroyers were sunk, RO 106 and 109, operating in January in the Huon Bay area, sighted several enemy transports and escort craft, but had no chances of attacking. Row 105, likewise, had no opportunities for attack in the Sulumi area. Row 100 was sent on transport duty to Buin at the end of October, owing to the critical situation on Bougainville Island. When 30 miles west of Ema Island, however, before arriving at Buin, she was sunk by torpedo on October 25. Row 104 and 105, while sailing to Sulumi with supplies during late October and early November, were ordered to help relieve the position in the Bougainville area and took part in the Bougainville area sea engagement. But they had no successes to record, although they rescued the crews of the light cruiser Sendai and some crashed aircraft crews on November 2 and 6 respectively. In early November, our cruiser force was bombed by enemy aircraft after entering Rabaul, and as the other surface ships too were continuously being damaged by air attack, it was decided to withdraw Chogai the flagship of the 7th Submarine Squadron, to home waters. The staff were landed and the Admiral's flag was flown at the submarine base. By the end of November, the submarine strength consisted of four vessels, RO 104, 105, 100 and 109. In addition, submarines E-38, 16, 6 and 117 were carrying out transport duties. Subsequently, Rabul was totally unable to carry out its functions as a base owing to fierce enemy air attacks, and in the period up to March 1944. This is when the 7th Submarine Squadron headquarters was transferred to Truk, submarines Row 104, 100, 102, 103 and 107 were sunk. This left only RO 104, 105, 108 and 199 to transfer when Rabul, of many memories, was abandoned for Truk. To that date, our losses in submarines in the Solomons, New Guinea and Coral Sea area totaled 25. Losses inflicted on the enemy included the aircraft carrier Wasp, 14 other ships sunk, and three badly damaged, but it must be remembered that the maximum effort was devoted to the supply of provisions, which brought no dividends in enemy losses. In July 1942, after graduating from the advanced course at the submarine school, I was given command of submarine Row 31, attached to the Yokosuka Command. We were busily engaged in training and in urgent trials and research, from which there was no respite. One day, a military truck loaded with bags of rice suddenly appeared at the wharf near the naval port, bringing a number of naval and military officials who requested us to try out firing bags of rice from the torpedo tubes. The situation at Guadalcanal Island made it dangerous for our submarines to hand over supplies when surfaced, so the idea was to eject them from the tubes when submerged. 
We tried all sorts of schemes over a period of three days. Biscuit boxes were fired, but about a third of them were broken by the projections inside the torpedo tube, and the all-too-precious rice was being scattered all over Tokyo Bay. Then we had the idea of stacking rice in rubber containers on deck and fitting a device to release them from inside the boat while submerged. Finally, we tried firing the rice in a wooden container shaped like a torpedo, but the container broke up and likewise the bags of rice. We should have realised that this plywood torpedo was hopeless from the start, in view of the high pressure necessary to fire it to overcome the water pressure. A weakened firing charge would have been insufficient to effect a proper discharge. At the end of the trials, the naval commander-in-chief at Yokosuka was obviously very moved when he spoke to us about the sorry plight of the garrison at Guadalcanal and the necessity for attempting such fantastic measures. After the American attack on Guadalcanal on August 7, 1942, supplies had to be brought in by destroyers and submarines, owing to the continued heavy losses in other surface vessels occasioned by the enemy's air superiority and our lack of airfields. In fact, after our defeat in the third general attack, there was no hope of recovering the aerodrome, and the garrison had to rely on submarines for supplies. A conference was held at Truk on board the submarine fleet flagship to discuss matters. All the senior officers of units and commanding officers of submarines were opposed to a plan which would virtually send the boats to their death, merely for the sake of supply landing, a purpose divorced from the normal functions of a submarine. However, the Admiral commanding the submarine fleet announced that it was the Imperial Command that the troops on Guadalcanal Island were to be supplied at all costs. No further dissentient voices were heard. Thus, our submarines became carriers, and the great majority at that time dispersed patrolling the high seas, the Pacific, the Indian Ocean and the Australian waters were in search for targets in the shape of warships and merchant vessels. They were recalled to the confined waters around Guadalcanal Island and were relegated to lying in wait, submerged, for enemy patrol craft and submarines. Each submarine had one gun removed and was left with only two torpedo tubes, a modification which, while giving them more space for carrying provisions, greatly reduced their offensive power. Instructions issued by the Commander-in-Chief Combined Fleet on November 16, 1942, set out the plan to be followed. Supplies were to be taken on at the port of Buan on Bougainville Island and landed at Kaminpo on Guadalcanal Island, one submarine making this trip each day, following a route lying to the southwest of the New Georgia Group. When destroyer transport was being used simultaneously, routes and areas of operation were to be fixed in order to avoid congestion. In the event of serious congestion, submarine transport would be cancelled. In order to avoid confusion with midget submarine units, all movements were to be carried out south of the bearing 320 degree from Savo Island. Supplies were to be unloaded mainly in the dark hours after sunset. During the three months from November 1942 to early February 1943, when Guadalcanal Island was finally evacuated, this transport scheme was carried out in the face of heavy losses. Eleven submarines were used early in December 1942, and a submarine supply line was instituted to Buna in New Guinea, for the same reasons as at Guadalcanal. By January 1943, there were about 20 submarines engaged on supply duties, including most of the latest types. However, the withdrawal from Guadalcanal was completed on February 7, and after the end of January, only two boats in the New Guinea area were still engaged on these duties. As time passed, progress was made in the method of transport. At first the packages were passed by hand from the inside of the submarine and transferred to motorboats. Then the rice was packed in rubber bags secured to the upper deck, but they got soaked with water, so from January on drums were used instead. If it was difficult to surface at the appointed landing point, the drums were released and rose to the surface while the submarine remained submerged. After the middle of January, freight tubes were adopted at Guadalcanal and the disembarkation point was fixed in the vicinity of Cape Esperance. A freight tube resembled a motor landing craft fitted with a deck. Two torpedoes were used for motive power, producing a speed of three knots. Its radius of action was about 4,000 yards and it could carry about two tonnes of supplies. It was piloted by one man who embarked prior to launching 
and could be released from a submerged submarine. There was one other method used in supplying Guadalcanal. This was a tanker-like submarine which was towed, and which submerged with the towing submarine. This craft could carry 50 tonnes of goods, but in practice it was very little used. In the early 1943, the island was still being supplied by one submarine a day, but as enemy strength gradually improved, our successes correspondingly diminished. However, there was no alternative, and these methods of supply continued until the end of the campaign. Submarine 1-1, under a new captain, Lieutenant Commander Sakamoto, left Rabul on January 26 in preparation for a night supply run to Guadalcanal three days later. At this period, supplies were being delivered every two days. One submarine was able to provide the land force of 30,000 men with two days' supplies. The round trip took four days. From Bougainville on, the voyage was submerged both by day and by night, only surfacing for about four hours to charge the batteries. The landing point was Kaminpo. The normal practice was for the submarine to enter the anchorage at dusk with conning tower awash and only proceed inside the reef after a careful inspection. On this occasion, I-1 was proceeding as usual and had just raised her periscope at the entrance when she was attacked from astern by an American torpedo boat firing machine guns and torpedoes from a range of about 2,000 yards. Sakamoto at once abandoned the idea of entering the reef and without waiting to lower the periscope altered course and gave the order 90 feet in a desperate effort to escape. He was too late and depth charges exploded almost immediately overhead. The inside of the boat was suddenly pitch dark and the concussion was terrific. The main switch on the switchboard went flying and all the motors stopped. Neither the rudders nor pumps would work. The high-pressure air pipes were broken, the batteries were out of action, and confusion reigned in the control room. The boat, with a bow-down angle of 45 degrees, was plunging to the bottom out of control. Every loose piece of equipment and cargo went tumbling forward as the downward plunge continued. Sakamoto ordered full astern on the main motors and the main ballast tanks to be blown. The safe diving depth for I-1 was 190 feet, but the depth gauge was hopelessly inaccurate after the depth charging and was registering 450 feet. Suddenly, the man at the after hydroplanes, who was bracing himself for the moment when the boat would cave in owing to excessive water pressure, reported that the needle of the depth gauge was stationary. Then the boat began to rise. Almost simultaneously came the report, water coming into the torpedo compartment. All the provisions had slid to the forward part of the submarine, which was becoming increasingly heavy. Then she broke the surface. She went down again, but was so heavy forward that it was impossible to proceed submerged. Then the boat appeared to come to rest on the bottom with her bow down at a very steep angle. The time had come to take the final step. With a struggle, the boat was brought to the surface and fire opened on the destroyers and torpedo boats.